I've been doing this job a long time. Came up through the ranks, made lieutenant in charge of my own task force, human trafficking. I like to believe we do good work. We collaborate with community-based organizations and NGOs identifying and apprehending traffickers as well as so-called boyfriends on reservations who've turned pimp to pay off drug debts. We even have a native tribal social worker on staff to help victims with counseling. It's always the most vulnerable who are taken advantage of, right? Well, folks on the res are broke. They get by by how they get by. Let's face it, this was their land. They got a raw deal. And if I'm being honest, anyone who isn't Caucasian has had it rough in Minneapolis. I'm of Puerto Rican descent, but I grew up in the Bronx. Well, in the 1980s, the Bronx was burning. My dad was a construction supervisor and Minneapolis had billions to spend on redevelopment. His job offered him an opportunity to relocate and he took it. <laughs> Minneapolis couldn't have been more different from New York. In New York, I had Dominican friends, black friends, Italian friends. And when we moved here, not so much. My dad made good money out there. We didn't live in the hood. I was always the minority of the minorities. No matter your background, it comes with pride. So I didn't take it well when anyone I would meet thought I was Native American. Because I wasn't. Because I'm not. And it's not okay to lump people into a group because you are uneducated. I hated that. So I'd push back, you know, fights in school, on the playground, but I was never a criminal. As a person of color, I've witnessed the ugliness of Minneapolis that comes with racism. I read that Minneapolis outlawed slavery and the African-American community here was thriving until I-94 split off the community from downtown. And you can find that to be true anywhere in America. Now, if you wanna look for the demarcation line between the haves and the haves nots in America, locate the freeway. They did the same thing to us in the South Bronx with the Cross Bronx Expressway. Slavery outlawed. It's fair to say when when it's written in black and white, hasn't resembled the reality of black and white in Minneapolis. I mean, it's pretty sad to think that in 1967, African Americans were fighting against discrimination and police brutality then. 50 years, we're still here. Like I said, I'm Puerto Rican from the Bronx, but I remember two separate occasions when I had bad runnings with the Minneapolis PD. First time I was 14, broad daylight. They slammed me against the hood of the patrol car, cuffed me, threw me in the back, and they told me that they were picking me as a suspect in a gas station robbery. Thank goodness I went to school with the gas station attendant and he cleared me. Second time I was 18, had my first car. It was an Oldsmobile, Cutlass Supreme. I was taking stuff out of my trunk and an officer approaches me and puts a gun to my temple and he says, run. He thought I was robbing my own car. Black or brown, they always thought we were up to no good. That's a fair question. Why I became an officer of the law. I honestly thought it was the best way I could be an advocate for my family and community. The best way to protect them. If they had a friend in the police department. I actually got my father out of a jam once. He was accused of being drunk and disorderly and they arrested him. Basically, he was leaving a bar after work and he wasn't walking very straight. My dad and me are very different. He's much more conservative. I love him, but we don't agree on much. He thinks people should fend for themselves. He believes in the bootstrap theory. So all things considered, when I turned 21, I thought going to the police academy was the quickest way of getting out of the house. I had a horrible time in high school with the whole American Indian thing. So I had no interest in going to college. So even after those traumatic experiences, it made perfect sense for me to join the academy. I was going to change things, right? After about a year on the force, I was working in the same precinct with the officer who put that gun to my temple. 
I made him remember. And I don't know if he meant it, but he apologized. So this has been my fight, trying to change things from the inside out. And like I said, I, I believe I do good work. The cases we come across in the task force would break your heart. Young native girls going missing, living through sexual terrorism, being abused, raped, mutilated. And the worst is the psychological damage that just doesn't go away. Being a person of color in America is hard work. When I first joined the force, I did neighborhood patrol like most cops and we had a handful of officers who treated African-Americans in such a way that made me uncomfortable to say the least. I did speak out about things I saw and heard. We just didn't have the leadership that we have now, so nothing really got done. So when I got a chance to run the task force, I took it. I was getting burnt out from street patrol. 2015, Jamal Clark was involved in a police shooting and Black Lives Matter held protests outside our precinct. But what's happening now must be like 1967 times 10. Black protesters joined by white and brown protesters. Every officer in the city, including myself, dispatched. The volume of voices in the streets, the smoke, the fire, the violence, and the tension in the air took your breath away. It was the tension in the air, not the smoke that made you gag. Hours after Floyd died, the police were holding the line, full riot gear and so many people, a sea of people marching towards us. And it's so loud. And we've got to hold the line, protect property. That's our job, property over life. The protesters reach the line and they get right in your face. And it's not about fear, I'm not afraid. If they try and meet us with force, we have rubber bullets, tear gas, tanks. But all I wanna do is advocate for them and protect them, brown and black, but I'm wearing blue. At this point, it's not about fear, it's about shame. For the first time in my career, I feel shame. I think about being slammed into the hood of that car I think about the gun to my temple and I think about being lumped in a group for the first time, I'm ashamed of the blue. They're right up to the line hurling phrases like sell out and spit at me. Traitor and spit at me. Racist pig and spit at me. Me. If they knew me, they wouldn't say that. And in that moment, all the other officers disappear and I'm standing there alone. I guess this isn't really new, living outside of the brown and the blue. Saliva dripping down my face shield, me clinching my baton and questioning what side of the line I belong on. I just don't know anymore. 